Adoption was legalized in 1952, since when over 40,000 adoptions have taken place, affecting nearly every family in Ireland. These are some of their stories. In 1970, Pat Gary met and fell in love with Pauline McHugh. I can remember when I first seen her. It was at a dance in the Longford Arms. She was dancing with a friend of mine. When we'd be dancing or that, you'd always make a point of bumping someone you knew, you know, sort of uh, purposely hit them a bump as you were dancing. And I got this bump and all I seen was her. And she had this huge grin on her face. In hindsight, now it was love at first sight. We had a long and a happy courtship, I suppose you'd call it, until she got pregnant. To be pregnant at that stage, 1969-70, it was just unheard of. We didn't tell anyone. No, we didn't want to tell anyone. Even her own family didn't know, her own sister didn't know it. I suppose in one sense we were ashamed more than anything else. We both knew what adoption was at the time. And it was a kind of an open and shut thing, black and white. That you didn't sort of hang on, you know, once you shut the door, that was it. Pat and Pauline got married a year later and subsequently had five more children. When the rest of my family came along, as they were born, it seemed to fade. I don't know if it's right to say this, but as if it didn't happen. She would remember her birthdays. I can only remember, I think, the first one or the second one, because she was upset. After a short illness, Pauline passed away. She was just 35. I could feel her saying, I'm sorry. I felt that. And then I remember thinking, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do wrong? And I thought then, well, giving up the baby. So I had five of them. Bearing in mind, Connor, the youngest, was only four months old at the time. I had this thought, well, thanks for God, I've only five and not six. Lucy Carty was adopted in 1970. When she was in her mid-30s, she decided to look for her birth mother. While I was married, I, it was something I knew I couldn't do. That I, I didn't have time to do, and my marriage was coming to an end. And that's when I decided then to sort of put the feelers out and see what could I find out. Hello, the laser and skin. Lucy speaking, how may I help you? Even when I met the social worker the first time, I did say to her, look, I, I really like to meet my father as well. That's not going to be possible, she said, because, well, first of all, we have to find your mother. You go through that process. And she said, in the vast majority of cases, the father is long gone. I'm going to switch on the machine, OK? Let's just hear the noise. All she had was just the hospital record of Pauline. And she said she was 23 when she had me. So I was working out in my head. Oh, she's 56 now, OK. I was working as a nurse at the time in, in, the, in the local hospital, so every lady around that age with the name Pauline, I was like, this could be her. This could be her. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, you know, this could be her, like, you know. The social worker only had the home address Lucy's mother Pauline had given in 1970, so that was the first place she looked. She had made contact with an aunt of mine. Type right, OK. Um, so she said she needed to meet me to tell me the rest of what this aunt had to say. And I said, is Pauline dead? And she said, she says, I really wanted to meet you face to face to tell you she's pet, but she says, yes, she is. And I was like, I was like, that's it. Story over. Shortly afterwards, Pat got a call from the social worker to tell him Lucy was looking for him. I was hardly able to stand up. I was... Happy and not happy in one sense, you know, I'm kind of stunned. And I rang my friend in the space of half an hour. Say, that phone call we always spoke about, the code comes, it has arrived. 
From the minute I got the phone call until I met her. <laughs> Is that right? It was the longest time ever I spent in my mind waiting for anything. <laughs> Pat and Lucy realised they only lived a short distance from each other, so they met as soon as they could in August 2008. I must have spent, I suppose, five or six hours anyway. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Nice morning, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to leave, nor neither did she, but we knew we had to. <sighs> Probably knew it was the start of something great, which it was. The next thing was I found her ringing me in the middle of the day and the morning and she could ring me at any time. She was dreaming, I'm at work, she'd say. I was not too busy. <laughs> this is what she used to tell me. She was excited, so was I. So was I, you know, I used to... It was lovely getting the calls and that. There was one thing that Lucy did in our house. She sat down on the couch and I put a chair under her feet and it says, relax there now, it says. And the next thing was she fell asleep. And I just looked at her and I says... You're home. Now, the social worker again had me prepared and she had told me that once you tell your family, that's it, it's out of your control. I had put their dates of birth on pieces of paper here and I had this one in my hand, you see. Dermot says, you have another piece of paper in your hand? Yeah, says I. He says, is it another baby? He says then. I says, you have it, you're right. But I still thought that when I told them, they'd be embarrassed and they wouldn't like it and it would be, you know, they wouldn't be happy about it or they just wouldn't like it, but the opposite was the fact. She was hyper too about meeting them and she couldn't believe she had a whole family, brothers and sisters and all that. I'm dying to see them. I really want to see them. I'm bursting to see them. I didn't... The fact that Pauline was dead, yes, it did. It did affect me and I did, I did shed tears over her. But the happiness then, you know, Pat was there and the rest of them were there. Like, I was dying to know all about them and everything and what they were at. I was really excited and nervous at the same time. So she, we told her we were coming and as we were going in, she was there at the door and you could see her, it's like, you're my sister, you're my sister. And I said, yeah. And she, she gave me a big hug. And it was like, we knew each other for years. I'd say, being honest, I could recall the first two or three hours, maybe. <laughs> After that, then, we, 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 I think we were meant to stay for five or six hours, ended up staying out for nine or ten. You're welcome. How are you? How are you? You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, Connor, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Connor. How are you? Pat brought her to meet me then when everything was finalised. Thrilled. Lovely, lovely person. The image of her mother, you know. Everybody all right there? You all have enough? There's loads more anyway if you need some more. I love when we get together. We were at her cousin's wedding and they put me in Pauline's place. They put me in her place at the table and I just thought, that is so nice. Like, they didn't have to. The stuff they don't have to do. Is everybody... Got a drink in front of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And there were two more surprises in store for Pat, his grandsons. The first time I met them was in Athlone. I met them in, in the Golden Island. <laughs> when the minute I seen them coming towards me, and I could see Noel, and I says, now there's me, that's me. It's a very weird thing, like when I do see them all, I think, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you. I grew up in a home where I am and I very was much loved and I had, I knew the love of a mother, which my siblings didn't have, you know, for mm. the, the last part of their lives. Oh, neither. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. The bossy one. You would have looked after us when uh, mum passed away. I suppose now I'm a mother now and I, each of them in turn, and I think, I'm sorry, I couldn't do more for you, but I'll do what I can now. <laughs> no, that won't be up now, let's leave that. Be I harbour no regrets as to what happened. For me to meet Pat, to know how he met Pauline, to know that he truly loved her. He still loves her. 
to know that I was conceived in love by two people in love. That to me changed my life, changed my outlook on myself, made me believe more in myself. I done the right thing. We done the right thing. And it's very frustrating that Pauline never knew that. But then maybe she does. No, I think she does. I found that I could very, it was very easy to communicate with Lucy. Like I could talk about things with her now that I wouldn't talk to the rest of my family about. And she'd offer to herself too much information, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, it would be going that far, you know. It's like best friends, sort of. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah, a really close friend. Yeah. yeah. Orla Grumley and Fred Raynard knew they were made for each other. They got married 11 months after they met and wanted to start a family immediately. I think adoption was always on my mind, always. I think before I even met Fred, obviously, I planned on adopting. And we thought about adopting very soon after we got married without knowing actually that we possibly couldn't have children anyway. We did go down the IVF route, and that was um, a very tough time of our lives, Rent really. Yeah, maybe. I think you go through the grieving process during IVF because each setback, each injection is a grief because it reminds you. Each time that Orla did IVF, she had a kick in the teeth every time. For me, Myself, I, I just wanted her to have what she wanted because I love her, of course. Above everything else, I love Orla and I want her to be happy. But I would also be the voice of reason saying, we're, we're adopting anyway. Fred and Orla started the adoption process six years ago and are well aware of some of the issues they face. Attachment is massively important in the first few months with this little one because it's going to come from a situation of having had so many carers that may not have answer to his cries during the night that may not have picked him or her up when they needed it. It's been able to say, look, we're going back to day zero. You are our little baby now. You don't have to be older than you are. Take them into our bed lovingly and start like they're in you. Wrap them up in rugs, let them feel close to you, that they are 100% devoted to. We are non-gender specific. I would. It doesn't matter. I mean, our natures say one thing. Oh, yeah, I'd be great with a boy. Our, and boys love their mummies. They do love their mummies for at least the first 45 years. Because there are so few Irish babies available, Fred and Orla have chosen inter-country adoption. People do come out of the woodwork and give you support. Sometimes you find yourself telling strangers just what you're up to. And they'll be going, oh, that's marvellous, tell me more. And then you go, oh, have I said too much? And then you just know that you might never see that person again, but you might just feel a little bit of glee inside your heart that you feel that that person approved. I thought it was a good idea. Or, you know, you make a great mom, and you walk away going, oh, I hope I do. You know, I hope I really do. Because I know he'll make a great dad. I know he will. He'll complain, but he'll be brilliant. I actually know too. <laughs> After Christmas, they received a call from their attorney telling them they had to be in Russia in two weeks. As they're not using a facilitator to organise everything for them in Russia, the pressure is on to make sure they're 100% legally compliant and all their paperwork is accurate and up to date. It has taken them six years to get to this point. Well, I'm looking forward to actually getting the ball rolling. Because up till now it's all been HSE stuff, it's been... Ireland, it's been paperwork, it's been homework, it's been home studies, it's been this, it's been that. Now it's actually starting to feel like it's actually adoption. You know? yeah. We have to expect that is a good wait ahead of us still, like another, at least another uh, six to eight months to a year, maybe even longer, depending on the list. So we're just going to go with an open mind, open heart, and just see, you know, where it brings us. I just don't know which suit I'm actually going to take, because I've got the trousers from one, jacket from the other. 
This first meeting is vital. If anything goes wrong, they can go no further. This is a one shot. This is our this one. This one shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the risk you take. It's as simple as that. I think it's our job to chronicle the journey there, the journey back, and everything mundane, banal stuff that might be going on in the town around our journey there, around the time of their babyhood, that that will be very crucial for the child. At least they'll have their own history. Do you want me to do that? No. No? Actually, if you turn it the other way. <laughs> it's pretty. Orla and Fred's attorney has advised them to look their best when they meet the Department of Education, as they'll be judged on their appearance before being approved for adoption in Russia. This is me being honest. It's, it's a case of, you don't have to do this much. You know, this could have been over and done with a long time ago. We're not adopting a son or a daughter, we're opt adopting a grandchild at this pace. It's, it's just insane. The big reveal. <laughs> How's that? A uh, bit big on the shoulders, but it'll do for its thing. They are my shoulders. Yeah, I know, but I'm just wondering if I could sit up a bit higher there, but it's fine, it'll yeah. do the job. And then we were interviewed over about a 10-minute period, wasn't it? It was there. It was quite quick. I, you know, it's kind of like I went through the motions, answered the questions that had been prepared, and it went, um, I think it went really well. And uh, we got a little wry smile, which was a really good sign. And it was, even our attorney was kind of pleased that we got that because it wasn't what people normally got. So I think it worked out well. Because Perm is one of the centres for intercountry adoption in Russia, they took the time to walk around the area to get a feel for where their child may come from. The ice village was extraordinary. It was a village with castles, statues with and castles statues. And also, but it was designed for the children Comedy. as a playground. Yeah. So all the kids and the adults were climbing up things and sliding down things. And it was everything. amazing. Was it fun. was a beautiful really piece of artwork. Mm. And so people, you know, they really loved their children. And when they brought their children around, they were like beautifully dressed. They were, yeah. you know, maybe one or two children per They were like marshmallow and, kids. They were all, the, you know, yeah, all these they, they, like were, they were fully <laughs> kitted. And I know one stage I said, you know, we're in the city. That could be where the child is already born. Now that they're finished in Perm, they have to keep to a very strict schedule to make their next meeting 500 miles away. After 14 sleepless hours on the train, Fred and Orla arrive in the early morning into Nizhny Novgorod, there, they'll present themselves to the Department of Education, much as they did in Perm. OK, so uh, we're due to arrive in Nitsny Novgorod very shortly. Uh, we don't know how we're going to know it's Nitsny Novgorod because they don't announce anything. All they do is stop the train. People tend to get off, nobody speaks any English still, and we're kind of going, oh, we kind of hope this is the right stop. <laughs> At the meeting, the authorities in Nizhny told them the process would take a long time, but they were given a glimmer of hope. They give you the worst scenario, which is two and a half years. It's most likely to take longer for a girl and for a boy or for non-gender specific. Um, it could be our feeling from our attorney and our translator, it could be a lot sooner than two and a half years, but they have to give you that eventuality um, so as not to raise your hopes. Um, I would probably think between... It, when we were leaving, the translator said, I look forward to maybe seeing you in the summer, which made me think maybe six months. Who knows? Many children in orphanages in Russia are there as a result of their parents' poverty. Back in Dublin, Fred and Orla have heard the Russian government is starting a scheme to support families financially, so children don't have to be adopted outside the country. However, this could cause their adoption to be delayed. It was only about a week ago we got our letter from Nidsny to say that there aren't any children under the age of 18 months old under the criteria we've requested. Um, and we have been thinking about, genuinely, about an older child, haven't we, in the last, a little bit older, we've two discussed and three. It. We've discussed but it. But the problem is, even to go back and say to the, um, the attorney and say, OK, we'd like to make the age older or make a broader older. spectrum or something, you have to go through a whole load of... 
And I don't think we could go through that Stuff again. Stuff again. Because you have to go back to the HSC and change your, your, day, your thing again. That means you're changing all your paperwork all over again. It has to be mm -hmm. notarised, apostilled and back over. The, it, and then you'd have to go and represent again. And people forget the cost attached to all this. And you know. at the end it's of the day... A, it's not an endless pot. Oh, this is too much, too, too much excitement. Go. <laughs> what we've been told yeah. is it could happen at any moment. Okay, this is the attorney, and you must be ready to go when they give the signal. But from the Russian side, they're saying it could be a very long time. A year but again, or two. they won't give any warning because literally, like, okay, you need to appear in three weeks' time. Roll for Russia. Yes, dance for Russia. Yes. <laughs> Imagine the emotional roller coaster that you'll be on in that time frame, waiting here in Ireland. While you know you're a child that's now for you and you're for it, him or her, is in Russia. You know, and you're sitting there waiting to go that whole oh, journey just, again. You'll have connected on every level. Like you'll just have been involved and you'll be going, I just want to, I, I just want to pick this child up and go. Even though the adoption from Russia might take a little bit longer, Fred and Orla aren't giving up hope. I think in life, it could happen. I just have this inkling that sometime in our lives, we will we will have Kidnap children. Something. We will have children around us, and I'm not sure what way that'll be. But Kidnap. I just feel it. And may we're going to be, be those crazy in, people with shopping trolleys. It may not be in the traditional sense. It may be just in um, an unorthodox sense. But I, we've always been a little bit unorthodox anyway. Do you think? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs>